We're joined today by Professor Kevin Munro, whose roles include the Ewing Professor of Audiology, Director of Manchester Centre for Audiology and Deafness, and Deputy Director of NIHR Manchester Biomedical Research Centre. Um, his team have been looking at the impact of COVID-19 on hearing and tinnitus. And your initial findings have now been published, Kevin. So what does the study actually tell us? Yes, thank you for this invite, uh, Nick, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about our study. Our study was published uh, just over, uh, just under one, one week ago. Um, the, the motivation for the study is that, um, I mean, I guess when you think back and we were having our turkey on Christmas Day, no one had any idea that this pandemic was going to strike. Well, it has done a sort of profound impact on us, but we are now over the first peak and we're moving from the acute effects of uh, coronavirus to looking at the long-term consequences. And in particular, what are the implications for the different organs or systems in the body? And we're now reading you know, in the newspapers and hearing on the news that it's not just a respiratory problem, but there are implications for heart, so cardiovascular system, uh, kidneys, uh, stroke, uh, whatever. Now we know that viruses can cause hearing problems. So coronavirus is a virus. So that raises a question, could coronavirus be affecting people's hearing? We carried out a study uh, where we were interviewing more than 100 individuals who had been admitted to hospital because of the severity of their symptoms. And 13% so just over one in 10 of them said that something had changed with their hearing since they had coronavirus. In half of the individuals, they said that there had been a deterioration in their hearing since they had the virus. And in the, the other half who said there'd been a change, they reported tinnitus. So just over one in 10 said, there's something wrong with my ears or tinnitus that I didn't have before I had coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And that's that's quite a that's quite a large number, and that's with people who have been hospitalised. What do you think the implications will be, perhaps, in the wider community for yes. those people that have had coronavirus and, and managed it at home or in a care home? Yes, well, the majority of people, of course, are not admitted to hospital that have had coronavirus. I mean, our, our assumption, and of course, we may be proven to be wrong, was that uh, the people in hospital had the more severe symptoms, so we were more likely to see a, a problem in that subgroup. Uh, the people who aren't admitted to hospital have what we rather call mild coronavirus, but if you speak to any of these individuals, they would say it's far from mild with a lasting consequence. And you know, these individuals have pneumonia, and not, we normally would not call that a mild problem. Um, what has struck me, is since our study was published last Friday and since it appeared in, in the media, there's been around about 100 emails I've received, personal inquiries from people who, I suppose the common theme that runs through the emails is that they're relieved to hear that other people report these symptoms because they thought they were the only one and didn't understand why. And most of these individuals that have contacted me were not people who had been admitted to hospital. Right. OK. I mean, have you any thoughts on the factors that could be at play here? You've mentioned, do you know that viruses can affect mm. hearing? But do you think there's anything else that has struck, yeah. struck you about the study from the study? Yes. Um, well, so we have to be very cautious how we interpret the data. And we really have to wait until we've done a more extensive study. It, it's possible, for example, that the virus is directly responsible for these symptoms, that it somehow has a, a damages the, the, either the cochlea or the, the auditory nerve. On the other hand, it might be that the virus has an indirect impact. So for example, the virus causes things to go wrong with our body, like inflammation, and then it's the inflammation that causes the problem we have with our ears. But we, we do have to be cautious because these were all people who were in hospital. And we know that if someone's in critical care, they tend to have all sorts of problems afterwards. So it, it, it's possible 
that if we'd asked anyone who'd been in critical care, they would be saying something's changed with my hearing and, and tinnitus. I mean, it, it's we think it's unlikely, but we need to go out and measure that. People who are in hospital and being treated uh, are given medications uh, for treating coronavirus. And we know that some of the medications uh, can have a damaging effect on the, the ear. So it could be the medication that's caused it. And there's a lot of stress and anxiety associated with being admitted to hospital with coronavirus. And we know the, the link between stress and anxiety and not sleeping and tinnitus. Um, and the fact that everyone's wearing face masks and face coverings right now immediately uh, prevents us from being able to communicate with ease. And we find that on a day-to-day -day basis, right, when we go to the supermarket right now, you're trying to understand what someone sent to you. And if you're in hospital, if you're struggling to breathe, there's lots of noisy equipment, uh, uh, you've got a life-threatening condition, someone's talking to you with a mask and a visor on, it, it, maybe that really just helps you appreciate that you do have an underlying hearing problem that you weren't aware of before. So there needs to be a study that untangles all of these different things. Okay, so is that what's next for you in this research, trying to untangle some of these <laughs> connections or are you looking somewhere else? Yes, no, we, we, we're very motivated to take this work forward. I mean, it's all the personal inquiries that have come in. It's kind of had a profound impact on us that there are so many people out there saying, I do have problems that we think this does merit doing a carefully controlled clinical and diagnostic study to really understand the implications on the, the, the um, uh, auditory vestibular system. And, and to some extent, to understand how common is it? So what is the, I suppose it's an epidemiology study or disease burden? Because services will need to know, are there likely to be bigger numbers that, that are um, uh, coming uh, uh, to us? So we want to estimate the, the uh, proportion of people who have these problems. And we want to compare people who've been in hospital who have coronavirus versus those that don't to separate, is it specific to corona uh, a virus? We then want to use a range of rather detailed clinical and advanced research test techniques to understand, you know, where, where is the anatomical location of, of this uh, a problem and understanding the severity of the the um, symptoms. Now, you know, we, we should be clear that we know that hearing problems and tinnitus often go together, but that's not always the case. There are people with a hearing loss who don't report tinnitus, and there are people with tinnitus who don't, at least with current uh, clinical tests, show up any problem on, on, on hearing tests. So we just have to be careful how we interpret that. We're also interested in um, looking at the association between these symptoms and maybe biomarkers so the comorbidity other health problems that individuals have maybe looking at aspects of um, uh, the care that they've had uh, when they're in hospital hospital the duration of the care the treatments that, that they have and and yes the point i made earlier that we're interested to know what might the impact be on clinical services to support people if there are big numbers with hearing problems or and tinnitus yeah, so I mean that sounds like a a, a big project and a and a sort of almost urgently needed project as people recover from COVID and we move into a post-COVID era. Um, have you got something lined up in terms of the study and in terms of funding for the study? More importantly, yes. Well, we're very motivated to take this work forward to try and you know, address these concerns that that people have. Um, we we have a research proposal. That we've written. Actually, I, I <laughs> stayed up most of last night writing this <laughs> proposal, which is the way that re most researchers uh, uh, seem to yeah. work. We're in a fortunate position in, in Manchester with the Biomedical Research Centre and the Manchester Centre for Audiology and Deafness that we have some great facilities at our disposal yeah. to use. One of them is a bespoke mobile test facility. So a van with a sound treated room so that we can drive to the home of individuals uh, and really making our study accessible to people who might otherwise not be able to join the study mm -hmm. or people who are reluctant to travel to Manchester when there's a, a pandemic going on. So that's something that I think is probably unique to us in, in the UK. We have a whole infrastructure at our disposal. So a lot of the costs that we're able to absorb 
ourselves. There, there are certain things that we can uh, absorb, and that is if we're going to be driving around the country, there are costs associated with filling our van up with fuel, <laughs> yeah. uh, for example. And also we would need to fund our research. We think the project, at least initially, can run for 12 months. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we may have resources for one researcher, but we need a second researcher. So we're, we're getting close. Uh, we think we'd be in a position to, to start the study maybe a month from now or, or okay. early October, assuming we can just get the remainder of, of the funding. Well, I hope you get the, the funding in place. I mean, it seems that COVID-19 is, is here to stay and that it's going to have an ongoing impact, even when people have actually recovered from the virus. I think that's correct, Nick. And uh, le less than 1% of the money for the NHS is directed to audiology or hearing services. So we're, we're rather under-resourced on what we're able to do to help people with hearing problems and, and tinnitus. And also less than 1% of all UK health research funding comes to hearing research and tinnitus research. So it's very under-resourced, but mm. we're very keen to do what we can right now while we have this um, a pandemic. Yeah, well, hopefully, I mean, you will get the funding and you will get the study um, underway very shortly. And hopefully perhaps in a year's time, we could be talking again about the findings from that and the implications that has. That would be great. I look forward to that. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. You're welcome.